Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be here with you. It's a joy for me to, to serve you with our Lord's Word today and His gifts. We are in our third Sunday in Advent, and we've got a couple very important announcements um, for today. So if you look at the back of your bulletins first, it's all in big red letters, so you know it's extra important. So for, for Christmas Eve, there are two we're going to do. This is the first time we're doing this, and it's because of COVID and because of the high numbers that we usually have on Christmas Eve service. We're going to have two services. So the first one you can see, it says 7 p.m. That's our normal time. And this one says service, uh, 7 p.m. service required to wear masks. The reason for that, typically we've been following all of our, our CDC guidelines, um, but because we're expecting a large number, right now the current stage that we're in, and we'll talk about that in a second, is that you need six feet between family units, and if you can't do that, then masks are required. And because we have uh, typically a huge number of people come on a Christmas Eve service, probably not gonna be able to maintain that six feet, and therefore the masks will, will be required. With the 1130 service, they will be not required because we're gonna have smaller numbers because it's later, okay? So if you definitely do not wanna wear a mask, come, just plan to come to the 1130. Um, this is the first time we've done an 1130, but actually this tradition goes way back in the church um, to have a midnight service that leads us right into Christmas day. So it's kind of a beautiful tradition. It is a little bit late, but um, I grew up with this tradition. Many churches throughout the centuries have, and it's a really nice way to enter into the Christmas, the Christmas season. So 7 o'clock, masks required. 11.30, masks not required, but, but suggested. So you choose what you would like to do there. Um, let's see, what else here? Pastor Ah gave me about a 30-minute review on make sure you get all the announcements straight, so i got to make sure I get them right here. Um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the service, let's see here. The, another reason for why for the 7 o'clock service we have, we're expecting everyone to be closer and mask required is because we won't have the gym available. That one's reserved. The gym's reserved for that 7 p.m. service. However, 11.30, we will have space in the gym. So if you know anybody that would like to come to Christmas Eve service but is feeling a little extra nervous about everything with COVID, have them come to 1130 and, and they'll have space in the back in the gym too so they can be totally separate from people and yet still be here for that. Both of them will be the candle, candle light services, so very nice service there. I think that's it for Christmas Eve. Um, Katie, if you're hearing me, if you could make, it, make sure that all that information gets on the, the electric sign outside, that'd be great. Um, any questions about Christmas Eve or any other announcements? <clears throat> yeah. Hello. We do have a good morning. We have the silent auction going on. Please join us. Get a number. If you're coming during the week and you don't get a number, it's okay if you write your name. That's fine. We'll find you. We're okay with that. And the... Mission Board is, wants everybody to know that all of the proceeds go towards the Poland Mission Trip and whenever that will happen, hopefully in the future sometime, or if the trips aren't going to be happening, they will go towards missions. All of that, the proceeds go 100% towards missions. And whatever that's going to look like in our future, and if some items do not get bid, we're hoping to hold them over for the next auction. It, unless people want to pull them back, if you donated them, that's, that's what we'll do. So let us know. Thank you for your donations. The tables look lovely. Good morning. Good morning. And <laughs> thank you and keep bidding and Merry Christmas. In okay. addition to what she just said, uh, we just put <coughs> three containers of our Christmas cutout sheets out. Uh, two of them have two bedrooms, and there's one with one bedroom. So whoever's taking care of the paperwork, I, I just set them out in the hall. Okay, very good. Thank you. We also have a voters meeting this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. It's a little bit of a, a change in schedule as, uh, from our normal voters meeting time. Um, or day rather, but we had to do that. So 7 p.m. this Tuesday. And the last announcement that I've got here is for Monday morning Bible studies. I lead a Bible study at 1030 right here in the back, right in the gym. If you haven't come but you've been interested, this would be a good time to come because we're starting a new topic. We've finished Hebrews, almost. We're going to finish this tomorrow. 
And then we're going to be starting a new, a new study on the church year, the different seasons, what they mean, what they teach us about Christ. And then we'll be studying a hymn for each season. We have such a wonderful, rich theology in our, hymn, our hymnody. So we're going to be doing that together and singing that hymn too. So 1030, if you're interested in a Bible study. I think that is it. So let's go ahead and begin our service with our first, first hymn right inside of your bulletin. Come, thou precious ransom, come. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may walk in your will. 
and walk in the ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this third Sunday in Advent comes from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the epistle reading comes from St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. According to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent by the Pharisees. And they asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one who you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Having heard the word of our Lord, we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe.
In the name of Jesus, amen. For our text today, we'll be focusing on one particular verse from St. Paul in our reading from 1 Thessalonians. He says this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. As a little boy, I remember sitting in my pew during Advent one year, and I remember looking over at the Advent wreath in my dad's church, he was the pastor, and I remember thinking, what is the deal with the pink candle? It just doesn't fit. The others are blue, everything is blue, the stoles are blue, the pyramids are blue, the banners. Everything fits that blue Advent theme, and then we've got a pink candle. So what is the deal with the pink candle? Obviously it does not belong, I remember thinking as a kid. And of course the white one's a bit different too, but that's bigger and it's in the center, so clearly that is a special candle with a special meaning, but the pink candle just does not belong. What is the deal with the pink candle? So perhaps you're a visitor, or maybe you're new to the church and in some of its traditions, and you've wondered the same thing. What is the deal with that pink candle? Or maybe you've been a member for many, many years and you still are not quite sure. Over the years in the church, one thing we learn about the church traditions is that they're beautiful because there's meaning behind what we do. So the liturgy that we use in our hymnals, the architecture even of the church, the stained glass windows lining the walls, the hymns, the colors, the clothing, the calendar, the advent wreath, even, yes, that pink candle has meaning. They all teach us something about Jesus. And this is a really good reminder for us as Christians because sometimes when we don't understand the traditions of the church, we're tempted to throw them out as something worn out and useless. Kind of like that worn sweater that you find in the dark recesses of your closet. You haven't touched it for years. It once served a purpose. It was once very useful. It was once not washed out and very worn. Once impressive, yes, but now its glory days are gone. So we thank it for its service and we place it in retirement in the trash bin. Or if you don't want to feel bad about being wasteful, you might bring it to the clothing donation shop even though you know that they might throw it away too because it's so worn out and so old. So sometimes we, the church, we view our traditions in the same way, like that old worn out sweater. Thank you for your once useful service, your once meaningful contribution, but your glory days are gone and it's time to go. And when we do that, we don't even realize what we're missing because we didn't understand the tradition and what it means. And on the flip side, when we do understand what they teach us about Jesus, how they help to shape and orient our lives around Jesus and what he has done for us, our church traditions become all the more beautiful. So let's get back to that pink candle right there. The candles, as Pastor Awe has been reminding us over these last two weeks, are given specific names during Advent. Hope. Peace. Do you know what this candle for today is called? Joy. And then the last one? Love. Yeah, good. Hope, peace, joy, and love. And where do those names come from anyways? Well, without getting into too much historical detail, basically this third Sunday of Advent, from the earliest times of the church, has been given a Latin name, Gaudete. Gaudete. And that means rejoice. Why? Well, because the intro it for today, an intro it is just an ancient church prayer that comes from the Psalms. The intro it for today begins with that very phrase in Latin, gaudete, or rejoice. So the third, so the candle, this third candle for Advent 3 is called joy. And it's pink to symbolize that very joy. It's a lighter color to lighten the mood, a brief lift and the heavier more somber, repentant attitude and mood of the Advent season. And really, throughout the centuries, many Christians during Advent would be fasting in preparation for Christmas, and 
fasting makes you kind of tired. And so this third Sunday in Lent would be a pink light boost of joy to help move the Christians along in their fasting for another week or so until Christmas Day, the great feast of the Nativity. So that is the deal. That's the deal with the pink candle. Now, this theme of joy, it comes up in our epistle reading from St. Paul. St. Paul is writing, to a letter, uh, writing a letter to a group of Christians, just like you, in this city called Thessalonica. And right at the end of the letter, he urges them to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. When that hits your ears, what is your internal response? How does that make you feel when you hear rejoice always? Maybe you feel pretty confident and you think, well, we should, and I think I can do it. I'm a pretty rejoiceful person or joyful person. Most of my friends would say the same, my family. Or maybe you struggle with it because you think it seems a little unrealistic maybe. And I have to confess that my very human reaction is to lean toward that latter option. Rejoice always? Come on, St. Paul, let's be real here. Life isn't just one nonstop chain of joyful happenings, is it? And Paul, come on, you know this. Wasn't it you who talked about that thorn in your flesh? You asked God three times to take away your thorn. If it had been joyful, you wouldn't have asked him. And wasn't it you who, were in prison, who was imprisoned and beaten and shipwrecked and eventually killed for your bold confession of Jesus Christ? Rejoice always? Come on. That doesn't seem very realistic. What's going on here? Was Paul confused? Was he just having one of those overly optimistic days where everything seemed so perfect that he wrote this phrase without realizing that the very next day he would be thinking, Oh, if I could just take back that one line. Rejoice always. Uh, that was kind of a lofty goal. Well, it couldn't have been that because we know that these are not St. Paul's words. These are God's words. All scripture is God-breathed. But what was Paul writing this for? What does, what's he getting at? What does he mean? So in wrestling with this question, it's helpful to see how St. Paul uses the words joy or rejoice in this same letter that helps us shed a little light on what he means. And it turns out that those words, joy, rejoice, they come up five times, just five times, in this short five chapter letter. So almost once a chapter, except for chapter four where it doesn't show up at all. And the first time that Paul uses the word joy in this letter to the Thessalonians is particularly interesting. Right at the first chapter, listen to what Paul writes. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers. Did you hear that? Paul says that these Thessalonians received the word in much affliction and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Affliction and joy side by side. Affliction and joy hand in hand, right together. And that helps us understand joy and rejoicing in their true sense for us as Christian. Sometimes we're tempted to equate joy with easiness or comfort or pleasure or maybe a pain-free living but that would be a mistake. That would be a mistake because our Christian joy is different. Our joy is in Christ. It's a Christ joy, hence the title of the sermon. And for the Christian, suffering and joy can and do exist side by side because of what Christ has done and said. That helps us reinterpret our suffering. So again, our joy in Christ does not remove our suffering. It reinterprets our suffering. It helps us see our afflictions and our suffering in a different light. So Christ's joy flows out of knowing 
that our Lord has not separated himself from your suffering. He's not seated at a distance, cold and apathetic to your suffering. Instead, he has entered into your suffering, participated in it in the worst way imaginable, and then he conquered it. And he promises to come back and get you too, so that you will share in the same victory. A new kingdom, his kingdom, where there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain because the old things will have passed away. Our joy, brothers and sisters, is rooted in that. And if the only way to participate in Christ's victory with him is to be crucified with Christ, to die with him, and then to be raised again with him, then let it be so. Let that happen. We should pray, Lord, allow any amount of suffering necessary in my life to keep me clinging to you. Lord, don't give me so much suffering that I despair. But Lord, don't give me so much ease and comfort that I wander away from you, as I know my heart so commonly, so easily does. I can't preserve my faith on my own, dear Lord. I'm too weak. So do what's necessary to keep me in your arms. And in the meantime, dear Lord, remind me of your grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and the victory that you have won for me. Preserve me in you, dear Lord. That can be our prayer as Christians. A Christ joy, once again, doesn't remove all our suffering, but it does reinterpret it. It changes how we see it. Now, as Christians, we know this, but it's really hard to believe it sometimes, isn't it? In this life, suffering comes from a variety of sources. Sometimes we suffer because of our own sin. There's nobody to blame except for you or for me. Other times we suffer because we're the victims of other people's sins. And sometimes suffering just comes because we live in a broken world, broken by sin. But whatever the cause, how do we often respond when our Lord allows suffering to come our way? If we're honest, sometimes we shake our fists at him, don't we? We shake our fists and get angry as if he owed me something, as if I were entitled to a joy apart from him. We throw a fit like a child. Things aren't going my way, and so I'm not happy about it. And I'm not happy with you, God. And sometimes, if we've already gone through those stages, we're just really tired. No energy to keep going. Life feels empty. No hope, no light, no joy. We're reminded that our faith and our joy is much more fragile than we would like to think sometimes. It's fleeting, unstable, so based on other things rather than Jesus and his promises. In moments like that, we see our idols, don't we? We see that really we were trusting in our own comfort, in our money, our stability, our feeling good, our control all along. Things that never belonged to us in the first place. Lots of false gods, and so we say, Lord, have mercy on me. But brothers and sisters, do you know what Jesus says in those moments? He comes to you, and he comes to me, and do you know what he says? He says, I know. I know you. I know you better than you know yourself. And that's why I came for you. I know your flesh is weak. That's why I gave my flesh for you. I know that your life is one big bundle of anxieties and twisted desires to control everything. That's why I gave my life for you. I know that you have a hard time imagining the future in a positive way. That's why I came to secure your future for you. Look to me, says Jesus. I'm taking care of everything. Look to me. I'm working it all for your salvation, and you have no idea what's in store for you. And while you wait, I'm with you. I'll never leave you, never forsake you. I love you. You belong to me. That's what your Lord says to you. And that's where our Christ joy is found, in Christ. And that joy, thank God, is not fleeting, 
is not unstable. It's sure and it's certain because Jesus is sure and certain and permanent. That's why St. Paul can say something so crazy today like rejoice always because he knows the reason for our joy and our rejoicing. It's Christ and his promises. To wrap things up, we should note that our theme of joy today also showed up in our Old Testament reading. Did you pick up on that? From Isaiah, it's a perfect description of the true joy that we're talking about. This true joy that's only found in Christ and this true joy that the world cannot understand. Listen, to, listen carefully to Isaiah's words. He says, I will greatly rejoice in my Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. That's the Christ joy that you and I and St. Paul and Isaiah and all Christians share. A deep joy, an enduring joy that the world cannot understand and the world cannot take away from us. And that joy leads us to break forth in rejoicing in this third Sunday in Advent. Gaudete. Rejoice. And remember, when you forget, that's the deal with that pink candle. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church printed in your bulletins on page 8. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your holy church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all the faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ, Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, and establishing them in the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy. Preserve our nation in justice and honor that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of the state, and to all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially Shelley and Sharon, Lyle, Kim, Kim and Joanne, Justin, Phyllis, Susan and Sarah, Beth and Ken, Bob, Kimberly, Don, Pastor Jeff, Howie and Mary, Joan and Clarine, Diane, Roxanne, Karen and Doug, Pastor Henry, Diane, Matt, Josh, and Bonnie, Katrina, Pastor Jerry, Steve, Deanna, Gary, and Sandy, Anne, Lori, Bob, and Will, Carmen and Steve, Randy and Corby, Butch, Joel, Norman, John, and Troy, Titus and Herb, Dr. Billier and Shirley, Robert, Jennifer, and also for our shut-ins, Shirley, James and Teresa, Bob and Jane, Lois and Florence, Doris, Dave, 
and Don and Glenda, Shirley and Rose and Lois. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, defend your, your church, especially St. Paul Lutheran in, Con in Concord, Nebraska, Trinity Lutheran in Davenport, Trinity Lutheran in Dayton, Grace Lutheran in Dewitt, the entire LCMS District, South Dakota, Concordia University, Chicago, Concordia Lutheran in Sioux City, and also Cornerstone Baptist Church in Orange City, Iowa, St. Paul United Methodist Church in South Sioux City, Nebraska. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. We stand and we pray that prayer which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our final hymn.
Thank you once more for being here with us this morning, especially to uh, to our visitors. Um, sure enough, I didn't forget an announcement. I knew I would. So right in your bulletin, there's an extra insert with colors on it. And this is something that many states have done to make it easier to know where we fall in the COVID restrictions. So this is what our, our governor has decided to do as well. And so we will be using this color scheme to help guide us. If you look in the left column, the only two, um, let's say the only two rows or categories that are relevant to us are churches and then two spots down where it says indoor gatherings. So that's kind of something to keep an eye on. And currently we are in that orange column. So that's why it says six feet of separation between household units and then a two, two spaces down for indoor gatherings. 25% parties of eight, uh, six feet separation. So Angie, our secretary, will be posting the color so that way you can refer to your sheet. So hold on to this sheet. Um, uh, that way you kind of have a good feel for where, we at, uh, where we're at as we move through the weeks. I think that's it. Thank you to Dave for, the, for helping and Claro for the nice music and to Katie also for taking care of our technological needs. God bless you. Go in peace. Amen.